Grace Hopper was one of the pioneers of computer programming. Already an accomplished mathematician, Grace joined the Naval Reserve in 1943 to assist in the war effort. She was assigned to a research division which worked on the Mark I computer, which performed calculations for the Navy. She quickly gained the attention of her colleagues, earning the nickname Amazing Grace, and her career continued long after the war ended. One day, Grace and her team were in the lab trying to figure out why their computer had shorted out the night before. They spent nearly an entire day combing through thousands of electromechanical components and hundreds of miles of wire before finally, lo and behold, in Relay 70, Panel F, a large moth was found. They pinned this moth to their group logbook with the comment, first actual case of bug being found. And I swear I didn't plan this, but this moth was found on September 9, 1947, exactly 70 years ago today. Grace Hopper left behind a profound legacy beyond our now common usage of the word debugging. She invented one of the first compilers based on her belief that computer languages should be based on human languages. She also popularized the notion of machine independent programming languages, which led to the development of COBOL, which is what I'm here to talk about today. Now, if you're not a programmer, you probably have no idea what COBOL is or why it matters. But if you are, you are a programmer, you're probably thinking, where's the exit? <laughs> Let me give you a quick breakdown. COBOL is a programming language invented in 1959, standardized in 1968, and shortly after received widespread adoption throughout the government and private sector. COBOL stands for Common Business Oriented Language. And as the name suggests, its usage was primarily in business and banking applications, though it was also used to manage train timetables and air traffic control systems. In other words, COBOL is a really old programming language that programmers used a long time ago. Are you on the edge of your seat yet? <laughs> Probably not. So let me give you a few facts from 2017. 43% of banking systems are built on COBOL. 80% of in-person transactions use COBOL. 95% of ATM swipes rely upon COBOL. There are still 220 billion lines of, use of COBOL in use today. How about this one? There are 200 times more COBOL transactions a day than there are Google searches. So clearly COBOL continues to matter today, even though it was a language invented in the 60s. So why is that a problem? Well, only one in four universities today teach COBOL. Even then, it's usually an elective. And even then, it's usually bundled together in a type of survey course covering a variety of legacy languages. COBOL is the quintessential old dusty language that no one wants to use anymore. When you're talking about legacy code today, you're usually referring to COBOL. Here's what one industry leader had to say about it. Legacy code, the phrase strikes disgust in the hearts of programmers. It conjures images of slogging through a murky swamp of tangled undergrowth. Although our first joy of programming may have been intense, the misery of dealing with legacy code is often sufficient to extinguish that flame. But maybe that's just this one guy. To see if this attitude is present elsewhere, let's delve into a resource we all know to be a source of positivity and encouragement the comment section of YouTube videos. <laughs> the following are some actual comments I came across while researching COBOL. Horrible programming environment, horrible language. It's simply painful to even look at. A rusty spoon looks downright pleasant, fun even compared to this. I'd rather sell my blood. <laughs> These comments reveal to me what I already know by virtue of being a programmer and working with them throughout my career. There is not simply a lack of education when it comes to COBOL. There is an active aversion to it, a sense that having to work with it at any level would be a punishment. Also known as not invented here syndrome, even good code can be thrown out in favor of a programmer's destructive urge to rewrite the same systems according to their own preferences or aesthetic tastes. So we are running out of people who are willing to use COBOL. The best COBOL programmers have retired or are about to retire, 
and with them, vast knowledge of the systems they have built. Systems we depend upon every single day, whether we realize it or not. So where are the COBOL programmers? I do know one, my father. Here's a picture of my father in 1979. That's me on his lap, and that's my mom next to him with a Led Zeppelin shirt. <laughs> Shortly after this picture was taken, my dad had an accident, which left him paralyzed from the neck down. This was a crisis for my family on multiple levels, not the least of which was the practical question, how is he going to earn money? Before his accident, my father worked in a machine shop. As a new quadriplegic, this was no longer an option. After undergoing physical therapy for a while, he learned he could type with the aid of a mechanical device which fit around his hand, a hand splint. Almost naively, he thought, well, if I can type, I guess I can write computer programs. So he enrolled in uh, a course in computer programming, and though it didn't come easy, he graduated in 1984 when I was just six years old. He went on to work for a Department of Defense contractor, the Army Air Force Exchange Service, or APHIS, the largest retailer of military bases in the world. By the 1990s, companies were already trying to figure out how to get rid of COBOL. The web had arrived upon the scene, and with it, vast innovations in both hardware and software. So APHIS hired an outside contractor to replace their existing systems with newer technologies. This is now known as the rip and replace approach to dealing with legacy code. In essence, the contractor's objective was to rewrite all the COBOL code using newer languages. My father and many of his coworkers feared for their jobs. So what happened? They failed, completely. There was just too much code so much COBOL that it ran throughout the entire worldwide organization like veins and arteries in a human body. The engineering feat was just too overwhelming. It was like trying to replace the entire engine of a locomotive while still running. And that's the whole problem. When you're creating something from scratch, you can take all the time you need, reevaluate your assumptions dozens of times, engage in a period of testing or beta, but when you're migrating an existing system, there can be no downtime. It has to work immediately out of the gate. A few years later, APHIS hired a second contractor with a different approach. Working closely with the COBOL programmers, including my dad, they developed what is known as a wrapper solution. The concept of a wrapper differs from a full rewrite in a few important ways. First, it means we do not have to throw away the old code, at least not all of it. Instead, it is extended in such a way that it can interface with newer technologies. Second, building a wrapper involves close collaboration between two or more generations of programmers. They essentially must find a common ground with which their two systems can communicate. Within a wrapper, COBOL code and systems continue to run indefinitely, but moving forward, any additional functionality is built outside the wrapper in newer languages. Like the hand splint my father used to type with, the old technology, the hand, is not thrown away. Instead, it is wrapped in a newer technology that allows you to do things the old could not do on its own. There is something I find beautiful about this approach, because rather than dismiss or trivialize the work of the generation before, it actually validates their contributions. It assumes at the outset that their code actually works, and works well. So well, in fact, we admit we cannot simply rewrite it in our new sexy languages, in a matter of months or even years. And why should we? If we want to move forward with technology, why rewrite the same business logic over and over again? Wouldn't we rather create something new? It is exactly this failure to understand the reality of COBOL systems that has led companies down the road of expensive migrations, some of which have run in budgets approaching a billion dollars. It's not that companies are just too lazy to upgrade. In some cases, they can't. It just works so damn well. How profound is it that code written 40 years ago on machines that have literally a fraction of the computing power of the devices we have in our pockets is still so effective, so efficient, that most banks cannot even afford to write new software that does the same thing. The truth is, it is good code. It is code that is imbued with brilliance and efficiency.
It is code that was written with great care, sacrifice, and love. We don't often hear the words code and love in the same sentence. <laughs> but maybe that's part of our problem. We think of technology in mechanical transactional terms. But why do we think of technology in this way and not other things? Surely we don't think of art in these terms, or music, or literature. We take it for granted that the creators of these works invested huge amounts of time, effort, and yes, even love into them. And that is what legacy really is. It is a profound investment of care and sacrifice made by generations before so we can enjoy the gifts they left behind. Whether those gifts come in the form of paintings, novels, symphonies, or code that keeps airplanes from crashing into each other, groceries arriving on grocery store shelves, or ATM machines from losing your money. Now, before the YouTube comments start flowing my way, let me make one thing clear. I'm not saying we should all start writing in COBOL again. We should move forward with technology and all the amazing innovations that are being introduced all the time. But what I am saying is, without a basic level of appreciation for legacy code, and perhaps more importantly, legacy coders, we will be unable to bridge the old with the new. This is essential for any art form, any craft, to truly blossom. We must learn to adapt to old technologies as fluidly and elegantly as we do the new. When I was seven years old, my father taught me how to program. He taught me what loops were, what variables were, and how to interact with databases. These fundamentals have not changed since he introduced me to them over 30 years ago. I use them every single day. The principles of software engineering are timeless, and I believe we should honor those who came before us, who left behind great wisdom, code, and love. My father is here today, and I'd like to ask you to give him a round of applause today in gratitude to his legacy. Because the problem of legacy code will not end with COBOL. To all the software engineers entering the workforce today, I ask you to consider the cold hard fact that the hottest languages you are working in today will become the legacy code of tomorrow. What will happen to all of your hard work? Will it be discarded? Or will it be a contribution, another layer in a knowledge craft that will endure for thousands of years?